It's hard to believe that it's been almost 20 years since the last mainstream Half-Life game released, or more to the point expansion, in Half-Life 2 Episode 2. Now, there have been other Half-Life games released during this time, such as the VR-only Half-Life Alex and the excellent Black Mesa, as well as the topic of this video, Hunt Down the Freeman, a Valve-approved third-party Half-Life universe game. This is a game that I never played upon release due to a generally poor reception. However, after hearing that it has been dramatically improved over the last few years, I decided to check it out. Welcome, my name's Azadash, and welcome to my first look at Hunt Down the Freeman. Regular viewers of the channel will know I am a massive Half-Life fan. I frequently refer to it as the benchmark for first-person shooters. And while I covered some of the expansions on the channel when I first started, I wanted to wait until I became a better creator before I tackled a video on the original game, a day that is hopefully coming soon. While I have replayed the original campaign more times than I care to admit, Half-Life also served as my entry to the world of modding. Now, I didn't have access to the internet at the time, so my experiences were mainly relegated to the included demo discs on PC gaming magazines. I have very vivid memories of two mods in particular, they Hunger, a horror-based mod, and USS Darkstar, a somewhat sci-fi mod with an excellent story to boot. Now, when I did eventually get the internet, my options for both single and multiplayer mods greatly improved, but it's perhaps the early days of the single-player mods that I remember the most fondly. So when I heard about Hunt Down the Freeman, a Valve-approved single-player game based in the Half-Life universe, I was naturally very curious. Then, after I saw the first trailer for the game, my excitement peaked. This is exactly what I'd been waiting for, and I couldn't wait to try it out. Now, there was a lot of controversy prior and after the game's release. Examination of these events are outside of the scope of this video. However, I think it can be generally agreed that upon release, the game was not well received by fans, with glitches and bugs being a particular highlight in the commentary. I will typically try a game that others do not enjoy if I think it's something I might like. However, if a game is reported to have widespread bugs and glitches to the extent that were reported in Hunt Down the Freeman, I will generally avoid it. Something which I'd done until recently when I read, which was to be fair, mixed feedback that the game had been dramatically improved. After reading this, I decided to purchase the game from Steam. I paid $14.50 in Australian dollars, which translates to roughly 10 US dollars. My initial plan was to play through the game in its entirety to see just how much of an improvement there had been from the initial release, as well as enjoy a much needed visit back to the Half-Life universe. That plan didn't quite eventuate for a very unusual reason, more on this later. Alas, I did manage to fill several pages of notes with enough of my own impressions to objectively report on what works, what doesn't work, and what's flat out broken. In terms of my overall thoughts on the game, look, I can tell there has been a lot of effort and passion put into the game's creation. However, for various reasons, this effort and passion rarely translate to a game that is actually fun to play. Story-wise, you assume the role of Sergeant Mitchell Shepard, a member of the military who was involved in the original Black Mesa cleanup incident. The first part of the game serves as a prologue as such, where the player explores Black Mesa before ultimately being wounded and passing out, with the game then picking up in an abandoned hospital. Through a set of cutscenes, you then learn that you need to hunt down Freeman as you explore the game world through a set of largely linear levels with the ultimate goal of killing him. The game boasts that it includes 45 minutes of cutscenes, which to be fair are all really well rendered, However, I found the actual storytelling to be confusing, and even after reading more online, I still don't really understand the motivations of the main characters. I feel like despite none of the original games really featuring any cutscenes per se, I could explain their story a lot better than I could this one, and I think that comes down to the original's show versus tell approach. I'm also confused with the tone of the game, there are moments when the game has a very serious tone. Adam. What? My name is Adam. And we just followed orders. They sent us to do the job you guys failed to do. You killed your own people! Didn't you? By the time we got there, you guys already killed more than half the Black Mesa staff. 
That was different. How? Face it, Mitchell. I did nothing different than you. And moments where the game has an almost parody tone. That's real brave of you, Larry. Your country's proud of you. Hello? Me? I did not volunteer, sir. If your mother was alive, she'd be proud of you, son. My mother's dead? You might die, but that's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. <sighs> All right, I'll do it. Good. Take Larry with you. This really prevented me from developing any real emotional investment in the characters and by extension the game's story. At the end of the day, it is certainly a half-life story, but for me it misses the mark as to what made those original stories special. Before we continue, a massive thank you to those who support the channel. If you enjoy this type of content, please consider liking the video or subscribing to the channel. With that out of the way, let's restore our health turn on our night vision, and head back to 2018 to remember, Hunt Down the Freeman. Hunt Down the Freeman takes some inspiration from the systems and mechanics in the original Half-Life, but for the most part delivers a fairly different gameplay experience. Overall control and traversal see a major shakeup compared to the original Half-Life experience, with a focus on faster movement, different stances, and probably the most impactful, a parkour system. Now, parkour in games isn't new. There have been plenty of other titles which have used parkour mechanics. DICE's Mirror's Edge is a great example of a game that does this very well. There are two main reasons why I think the parkour system is so good in Mirror's Edge. Firstly, it's very consistent. If there's a particular surface or obstacle that you can parkour in one part of the game, you know that for the rest of the game, that fact will be respected and consistent. This builds player trust and predictability. The other reason is that the environments are designed with parkour in mind. Nothing feels out of place or artificially inserted. Everything is all very seamless in terms of the player experience. The problem with Hunt Down the Freeman's parkour system is that it's terribly inconsistent and most of the time when it's used in environments, it feels like something very artificial has been created to try and showcase the mechanic as opposed to it actually being useful. Take this drain pipe for example. While I'm certainly not an architect or builder, I can pretty much guarantee there is no reason you would run a drain pipe off a wall, put a 90 degree bend in it, only to run it down freestanding to the ground. Unless of course, you wanted to force the player to use the game's parkour mechanic and climb the drain pipe. Another example of mechanics dictating the environment is found within a railway station where the entire floor has been laid with claymores. Now, I'm going to be generous here and ignore the fact that this set piece doesn't really narratively make sense. However, the way you need to traverse this section is using the parkour mechanic to grab onto a pipe. I died so many times trying to walk between these claymores until I finally noticed a red handprint near the pipe, which is a mechanic never explained or shown in the game up until this point. Outside of control, the other area that's had a major change is the combat. Whereas Half-Life did include some large combat set pieces, the majority of combat was more slow paced, with the player rarely tackling more than a few enemies at once. Hunt Down the Freeman goes in the opposite direction, with a lot more enemies in each section, as well as a completely different weapon system, both in use and selection. First, there's the inventory selection system which is a menu which you're able to select a weapon to effectively bind to the weapon wheel. You can only have one type of weapon equipped per slot, so if you have a sniper rifle equipped, you can't quick toggle to a shotgun without entering the menu again. It works fine, and thanks to fairly differentiated ammo being spread through the environment, encourages the player to use different weapons throughout the game. Now, I want to separate what I'm about to explain into two parts. Firstly, the gunplay, in terms of how the guns operate, their animations, and the overall experience of using them is quite good, although I do wonder why the SMG has a scope on it. Anyway, on balance, the gunplay itself is good. However, the actual combat, including things like enemies and environments, are not so good, with everything from questionable enemy design choices to an over-reliance on endless spawning until an event or action takes place. Then there's the health system. You have two health items available, med packs, which instantly restore health, and pills, of some description, which require an animation to restore health. Generally, in most games I've played, if there are multiple health items, they are either all instant or all time-based. I don't really remember another game having one instant and one time-based, 
And in my opinion, this conflict hurts the overall immersion. If I had to describe how I felt after the time I spent with the game's combat system, I would describe myself as fatigued, and not in a good way. Now, normally when I examine a game, I split out the gameplay from presentation, as I am a firm believer that you can have a fun game with questionable presentation, and likewise a game with exceptional presentation, but little in the way of gameplay. I'm going to break that rule here, because I believe that the presentation in this case dramatically impacts the overall gameplay. First of all, I'm not sure the game is actually meant to look the way it does here. There are certain areas of the environment that look extremely shiny when compared to other environments with comparable light sources. I tried changing multiple graphical settings, but couldn't find anything that changed this. So either it's a bug, or it's the game's intended presentation. The environments themselves vary dramatically in overall quality. There are areas which look great and show a good level of thought and care put into them, and then there are areas which look and feel extremely rushed. For example, there are areas like Black Mesa which are well detailed and designed, and would certainly pass for a somewhat secret research facility. Then, there's a building which you enter fairly early on in the adventure, and I'm actually not really clear on what the building is meant to be. I thought it was a hotel at first, but perhaps it's an office building. Regardless of what it is, Everything about it, from the constantly changing floor patterns to the doors appearing to have slide locks on the outside, just makes it feel very rushed and lacking any real identity. The game, at times, also uses invisible barriers when it doesn't want the player to backtrack. Again, I'm not sure if this is a bug or intended design, but either way, it's not a good player experience and really hurts the immersion factor even more. Another thing, which I'm positive is a bug, is that from time to time, when I would transition between loading screens, the game would return me to the main menu with a set of errors displaying. Now you could return to the game easily enough, but again, this really hurt the immersion factor. But perhaps the biggest issue I faced was the one which effectively ended my playthrough and almost resulted in me not making this video. Generally, I won't create a video until I've played through a game in its entirety so I can see where it is at its best and where it's at its worst. However, given I had made so many notes about my experience during the time I played in the game, and that so many of my key points relate to systems and mechanics embedded into the core game, I decided I would make yet another exception to my rule and proceed with a video. Roughly a third of the way into the game, you encounter a train station with various trains in it and seemingly no path forward. I explored this area in depth. I even tried to backtrack to find out if I'd missed an item or something which was required for progression, but nothing. After spending far too long in this loop, I decided to do some research and found some gameplay footage of one of the allies using a torch cutter to open a sealed area. With this information, I went back and tried to interact with the various allies, all to no effect, until I found that if I moved in a very specific area, which I honestly found it hard to repeat even later on, it triggered a dialogue and saw the ally start to cut the door open. So I waited, and waited, and they never actually cut it open. Frustrated, I explored more around the area, spoke to the other allies, and even tried to kite them around to see if there was another scene to trigger. Nothing. Once again, after a long time where frustration had well and truly set in, I went back to the video playthrough, and I found that after the ally starts to cut the door open, aliens approach and you need to hold them off until the ally finishes doing what he's doing, the old endless spawning loop again. Only this never happened for me. I went back to multiple saves. I used Steam to verify the files. I uninstalled and reinstalled the game. No matter what I did, I could not trigger the next stage of progression. My PC meets all the requirements for this game, and both Windows and the game are fully up to date. After one last try of running around the area again, desperate to see if anything had changed, I did what I probably should have done a lot sooner, and gave up. I briefly considered using cheats to progress, but honestly, I already had so many things I wanted to talk about in this video, and I didn't feel that any further experience could objectively change my overall opinion on it. In terms of the sound design, it's okay. I had read reports that the voice acting was subpar, but honestly, in my opinion, it's fine and somewhat of a bright point when comparing other areas of the presentation. I did encounter some sound mixing issues when there were multiple effects and speech being broadcast at the same time, 
But honestly, it wasn't really a major issue and certainly not something which in isolation impacted the overall game experience. I said at the beginning of this video that it's very evident that a lot of effort has been put into the game, and I stand by that comment. However, too often it feels like the result of this effort lacks direction, consistency, and balance. Where there seemingly is direction, like in the choices for the mechanics, the direction appears to conflict itself sometimes. Hunt Down the Freeman often can't decide if it wants to be a fast-paced FPS, a stealth game, a survival horror game, or something else entirely. And yeah, it's okay for games to have multiple genres, but they need to be frictionless to the player, something that in this case, I'd argue they are not. Looking back, I'm honestly not sure how reports of the game being greatly improved surfaced. If my experience is typical of a new player, which I have not seen anything to say it is not, I can't imagine how the original state of the game fared. But that's enough from me. Do you agree or disagree with my opinions? Let me know down in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching.